Welcome to Bloomberg Law. I'm Lee Pacquia. Thus far, estimates of insured losses caused by Hurricane Irene are over $3 billion. Joining me now to discuss is Randy Parr. She is a partner at the law firm of Kazowitz, Benson, Torres, and Friedman, where her law practice focuses on insurance coverage. Welcome. Thanks Thank so much for much. coming back to see us. It's interesting to talk with you. So let's uh, start off by getting a l fleshing out your bio a little okay. bit more. How did you come to practice insurance law? It's not exactly something that uh, is taught frequently in law school. When I was in law school, there wasn't anything of insurance law. And like a lot of things, somebody comes to you and they have a need on a case and they say, will you pitch in? And I said, mm -hmm. sure. And what I've found is that insurance underlies an awful lot of other problems. And so if you get into insurance, you have a, you're participating in product liability litigation, securities litigation, um, patent litigation. So it'll, it, for me, in, in terms of enjoyment, it has allowed me to be very broad in what I do. Yeah, it sounds almost like bankruptcy law. It's an area of practice right. that touches on so many others. Right. So your clients are mostly all large policy, All policyholders, mostly uh -huh. large corporations. We don't represent insurance companies because right. there's really a, a division in the world between the interests of those two. Okay, well, paths. today we're going to talk about the whole insurance okay. industry in yes. general. Uh, Interesting uh, stat here. According to the uh, Insurance Information Institute, fewer than 20% of American households have flood insurance. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, yet so many Americans can be affected by floods or live in areas that are, are prone to flooding. Why do so few American households have flood insurance? It's an interesting question. Well, it is, it is very interesting, and I think flood is unique in that I think it's an underappreciated risk, so people don't understand. I mean, there were some statistics that in your average 30-year mortgage, you have a 25 or 26 percent chance of having some flooding if you're in a high flood right. area, as opposed to fire, which is 9 percent. Right. Yet all of us would buy fire insurance, and a whole lot of us would not buy flood insurance. Right. And flood insurance is particularly problematic. It can financially wipe out a victim. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, probably the payout on a flood claim is less than, say, the payout on a, on a fire claim. Mm -hmm. But it certainly can wipe out uh, a homeowner. Um, there are certainly homeowners that we've seen interviewed on the news who are now in their third or fourth flood. Um, hmm. And one of the interesting things about this, why the reason the federal f flood program came to be devised, because if you actually assess the risk of flood, the premiums might be so high that nobody would buy it. And so it's an example of how general funds are somewhat subsidizing the subset of individual homeowners who purchase flood insurance. It's almost like you have this problem where it would be cheaper and more economical for providers if more people in the country were in the position to buy flood insurance. How, how does this get resolved? Well, it's interesting because there's been a lot of talk lately about how to improve the federal flood program. Um, and one of the things which they target is trying to expand the number of people who join the program. That will increase the amount of premiums collected and it will spread the risk to a broader base. Mm -hmm. One of the ways to do that is some sort of mandatory requirement, which would be very interesting in terms of whether or not you can require people to buy insurance. Sure, that reminds me of another situation we're having in the legal world talking about health constitutional challenges right. to the health care. Yeah, or are individual mandates to purchase insurance constitutional? This is a very hot topic in the law lately. Well, they, they've done it sort of in a, in a halfway fashion by requiring if your mortgage has federal funds backing the mortgage, you are hmm. required to buy flood insurance. But another way of increasing the number of people um, buying flood insurance is to bundle the flood insurance with wind and fire so that the number of policyholders who will buy that kind of bundled insurance will increase and you increase the base and spread the risk. What about businesses? Mm -hmm. Do, are businesses in the same position where not so many uh, on a relative basis have flood insurance? Well, I think small businesses, that's correct. And there's mm -hmm. some provision for commercial insurance in the federal program. Most large businesses are able to negotiate and buy flood insurance. Now, there, there can be limits on the flood insurance and deductibles. That's the amount of money you have to pay before you can get insurance. But there generally is um, some flood insurance when you get to the large corporate level. Mm -hmm. So let's take a step back. For those that choose to get coverage for, for flood, um, they have to enroll in the National Flood uh, Insurance Program. Yeah, well, what is that and how does it work? Yeah, it was set up in 1968 and it, and it works, it originally worked where you bought, you bought a policy directly from the government. Mm -hmm. Now those policies are really fronted by a private carrier. Mm -hmm. But some still go direct from the government, right? There is some percentage yeah, that still small, go direct. Small it's a percentage. small percentage. But the majority are fronted by a private insurance company. The private insurance company is paid an administrative fee, but the real underwriting is backed up by the federal government funds. Mm -hmm. And the system worked okay 
in terms of collecting enough money to cover the average losses, and then Katrina hit. And they were overwhelmed with the amount of claims, and they had to borrow about $18 million from the Treasury. Mm -hmm. And the way it is priced now, it's 18, hard. 18 million or billion? 18 billion. I'm I think sorry. it's, yeah. Billion. yeah. Billion. Forgive me. Mm -hmm. and, and the way that the, the um, the pricing goes now, it's, it's hard to imagine how they're going to repay that. Right. So that's one of the impetuses for trying to resolve the system to somehow find a way where you can increase the premiums for they, so that they more accurately reflect the risk and have an extra for a reserve for a catastrophic right. There's year, a like GAO a report out suggesting yeah. that the NFIP is going to have a very hard time repaying that $18 billion. That begs the question um, as to what the program is going to do going forward. It, it's traditionally been funded on a periodic basis, I think in five-year increments. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We're coming to the end of a five-year right. increment in less than three weeks. Right. September 30, the program expires. Um, perhaps most interestingly, the biggest effect of that, that uh, expiration may be what it will have on home sales, because the extent to which home sales are backed by a mortgage that has federal, and there is no federal flood insurance, there's a real problem. You may freeze up the real estate market, which is not something which can take, you know, much uh, many right. blows. Right. So it's it's a, it's a big problem for victims of the most recent hurricane or yes. other floods around the country if this program lapses. But a larger impact of this could be a, de a, a, a detrimental effect on a housing market that's really quite fragile these days. Very fragile and very serious. I mean, I think there is there's some money in the system to pay existing claims for Irene. But you know, we need a system that ensures people going forward. And the right. present system that we have is really not adequate. Right. So there are a lot of different programs. I mean, certainly in the Senate, the proposal has been to just allow the um, federal program to uh, uh, allow the Treasury to, to forgive the debt. Mm -hmm. uh, that the program has. But there are also other provisions. The 18 that, billion holding the 18 over billion from, Katrina. from Katrina. What's the likelihood of that happening? Well, I think pretty good because if they can't pay it back, someone's got to pick up that debt. Yeah. And the, all that means is you're going to have the general taxpayer putting money into those people who suffered a loss from flood. Right. Um, there also are, are provisions that will allow uh, premiums to increase at a higher rate. Mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the sort of unique things is in the flood program, a house which repeatedly is, suffers flood it does not pay a higher premium than a house that hasn't received flood damage. It's incredible. So it is incredible. There are certain you know, regulations which limit the ability to isolate problematic properties. Mm -hmm. That can probably be done, be done away with. So there are lots of diddle, little tinkering which can happen to the uh -huh. program which will make it more financially solvent. What about larger changes? The, U, the United States is unique in the fact that the government basically underwrites coverage for flood. Other countries, the private market takes care of it seemingly without any problem. Should we be talking about an entirely different system? Do you think there's any likelihood we might get to that point? Well, I think I think we are talking about different systems, and I think most of the programs in the, both the Senate and the House do have a provision for a study group to the extent to how radically should we resolve um, the way the program is structured. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly going to the private system the way a lot of European countries do means that the flood insurance is very, very expensive. That will mean that not many... Um, middle income or low income people will buy it, mm. and that will mean that then when a flood happens, they will have to receive general assistance out of the general fund. Mm. So, you know, somehow floods become very political, they need to be met, and the question is how do you fund the, the, the money? Right. You now, know. now, this might be a non legal question, forgive me, but from your perspective, is the national trend line on flood disasters or flood related damages, it, it seems to be increasing from, from my perspective, but. You mean the occurrence of, of yeah. flood damage? Well, I think we're in, a, we're in an incredible year, and I, we had a bad run of problems. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, this comes uh, uh, upon f from the international. You have the tsunami in Japan. You have floods in, in New Zealand. You have problems in Australia. Um, there have been a number of severe floods and tornadoes in this country. You have the Missouri mm -hmm. um, tornado. So people think, and it, maybe it's global warming, if that's your, that's your take on, on climate change, but certainly the number of severe catastrophic events has increased. And that means that any, the next one is always more um, significant in terms of putting you over the edge where you can't fund it. Mm -hmm. Now, part of the process for filing a claim under the NFIP, you have to deal with a claims adjuster mm -hmm. uh, from the government or from a private company. Uh, Bloomberg reported uh, last week, I believe, that there is a shortage. FEMA has a shortage of claims adjusters and has actually called back um, many workers uh, whose credentials have lapsed. What well, to make of this? Is this a common occurrence? Well, I think it's more and more now as we're trying to cut back on federal programs, and the federal programs have to lay off workers, and then suddenly you need the federal program, so they're caught short. Mm. Um, so now you're getting people certified who maybe, uh, maybe it's been a while since they've actually done their job, but a lot of the claims handling 
is done by the fronting private insurers and then it's reviewed by FEMA. So you don't really have that many government workers going out and looking at the claims, right. but you do have them reviewing So claims. will people or businesses potentially miss out on being able to uh, uh, file their claim under, under the correct procedure if they can't have enough workers to fill, fill the task? Well, one thing that's important in all insurance questions is to you know, put in your claim as soon as you know. Give notice, mm -hmm. put in your claim. Same thing with this, and there's actually a 30-day period that you have in which to put in a claim. Mm -hmm. So. You know, the, the word is put in your claim. If you have to adjust the amount of the claim, fine, but make sure that you get in within that 30 day period. I wanted to talk to you about business interruption sure. claims coming out of Hurricane Irene. What does the picture look like? Is it too early to tell? Um, I think it is too early to tell because business interruption claims take a while to assess. But what's, what's interesting about Irene is um, you didn't have that much property damage in the traditional sense, but mm -hmm. you may have had. Uh, businesses closed, at least in New York, by orders of civil authority. There are different kinds of coverages in a property policy. It doesn't require the policyholder's property itself to be damaged, but if your business is interrupted because of damage somewhere else, property damage somewhere else, you have potentially a claim under your policy. Mm -hmm. And those are a lot of the kind of coverages that are being accessed now because mm -hmm. of Irene. Generally, how long does it take to figure out what a business interruption claim is going to look like? Or why is it so different from, from other types of claims? Well, probably, probably um, depends upon what business you're in. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of it, business interruption provides coverage for the profits you would have earned ah. had you not been interrupted. Mm -hmm. So you have to figure out how are you going to prove what your profits would have been. Now there maybe there's an historical rate which you can look at what you made on a weekly basis before and mm -hmm. what you made during the period of interruption. But, but sometimes it's very difficult if the interruption affected um, commerce. I mean, I did a lot of Katrina claims, mm -hmm. and one of the impact of Katrina was its disruption of international trade. Well, it's very hard to really track that through, what the actual property damage did to interrupt the trade and what the economic consequences are. Mm. So it can be difficult. Uh, this is complicated stuff. What should businesses be doing right now to protect themselves going forward? Well, if they think their business was interrupted, I would do the best that I could in sort of estimating the amount and put in a claim or put in a notice letter to your insurance company that says because of Irene and give as much detail as you can about your business, what the interruption happened, and put in the notice of a potential claim into the insurance company. Then if you, if you don't have a good assessment, then you have to get an adjuster to come in and do an assessment of what the damage was. All right. Randy Parr from Kazowitz Benson. Thanks so much Thank for coming in today. Thank you very much today. for having me. That's Randy Parr. She is a partner at the law firm Kazowitz Benson. For more information on insurance law issues, be sure to check out Bloomberg Law's Insurance Law Report. It's available on BloombergLaw.com. I'm Lee Pacquia. Thanks for watching.